Pegimel 83a. Yes, no, it's I think you're better off. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay, Hakosim Lishto, man that has certain financial rights mm -hmm. in his wife's properties. He writes to his wife, Dinud Varm Edli He says, I have no inch claim to your possessions. Hareza Uchel Peres Bechayo. Even though he wrote that, he eats the profits when she's alive. Meaning, like Nichse Meluk, the Mesa, and if he dies, if she dies, Yorsha, he inherits her. Even though he says, I have nothing to do with your, your assets. So what did he mean? What was his intention when he wrote, I have no claim to your assets. That if she should sell it off, it's valid. Normally, he, she sells it off, it's not valid. But because he, he wrote to her, he said, I have no claim to your assets, therefore if she sells it off, it's a valid sale. Gemara discusses this. You hear this? Norman, you with me? Because you see, he's very unspecific. I mean, how do we know that? He, the Gemara's going to discuss this. He says, I have no claim to your assets. So maybe everything, no claim whatsoever. Right? So what, what, what the Gemara's going to explain, it's the minimum amount he gave up. The minimum amount is that if, that what, if she sells it off when they're married, that he's relinquishing the right to. But if she dies to be the heir, he's the heir. To get the profits off the properties, he's not giving that up. How do, the Gemara's discuss, how do we know that? What about he's more specific? He says, I have no claim not only to the properties, but even the profits of the properties. Yeah, perosayim doesn't mean fruits. It means the profits. So if he said that, when she's alive, he has no claim to the profits. If it's, let's say, a, 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 a building, rent, if it's a field, the produce. The, not a vow, no. It's, he's relinquishing a financial, no, he's not a vow. He's writing, a, uh, he's saying words. He, he writes, he writes in a document. Vimeso, but if she dies, Yorsha, he inherits her. Because what did he give up? He only gave up what he, what he said specifically, right? The, 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 the land and the profits, that's as long as she's alive. But if she dies, he inherits her. He didn't give that up. Review Domeel, the Olam, Ochel, Peri, Perus. You hear this? When he writes, I relinquish my right to the land, to the assets, to the fruits. What about the fruits of the fruits? Right? Review this says, unless he relinquishes that, he, meaning, let's say, he says, I'm relinquishing my right to the properties and to the profits. So the profits are hers. Now, what about she takes those profits and she buys land and this produce? The produce of that land that was bought with the produce, that's the fruit of the fruit. Review this says he didn't give that up because he only wrote in a document. No chasayach u the property with its produce. He didn't, he didn't relinquish the produce, the profits of the profits. So therefore, he still has a claim to that. That's Reb Yudah. At what does he have to write to relinquish it totally? Yeah. The fruits, the fruits of the fruits, ad olam forever. That means as many times down the road, multiples, outgrowth, he's, he's giving it all up. No way, those produce, the produce is his, but it lets he gave up that produce. No, uh, no, the produce is his produce. The produce is his produce. No, wait, wait, wait. this land and this produce. Who owns the produce of that land? He does, the husband. It's not even... He has the, he has the, he, so that's the produce. The produce is the profits of the land. That's his land. Because that, the produce was his. But let's say he relinquished the produce. Right, 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 right. What about Kosov law? Dinu dvarm edli b'no chasayich. U perisayim. U peris The fruits, the fruits of the fruits. 
Bechayech or Bemosoch. Hear this? He's more specific. When you're alive and when you die, and Ochel Peres Bechayeho, he doesn't have any of the prophets when she's alive. The Mesa in your ship, because he says clearly, I'm giving it all up. When you're alive, when you, if you die, I'm relinquishing everything. Reb Shem Gilead, the old man, no. In Mesa, Yerusheno. Even though he said, I relinquish my rights as an heir, that he can't relinquish it. Why? Because on a Torah level, Shem Gilead was of the opinion that a husband that inherits the wife, you can't make a, a, a condition. Let's say a son says, I will not inherit, inherit my father. It's not possible. The Torah says if a person loses his father, the properties immediately transfer. The assets transfer. You can't, once you inherit, you want to disown it, that's your business. But to say I'm not even to be the heir, you can't say I'm not an heir. So since Rabbi Shimon is of the opinion that a husband is the heir, is the first heir of a wife, even before her father. A husband inherits a wife even before her father. So if that's the case, he says, well, I, have, I, I, don't, want, I don't want the Yerusha. There's no such thing as not wanting Yerusha. Torah says, you're an heir. If you're an heir, you inherit. Okay? Let's see, he's a wealthy man. So he wants to show how magnanimous he is. I don't want anything from you. I'm marrying you purely for you, not for your assets. So I don't want the land. I don't want the prophets. I don't want the prophets of the prophets. I want nothing, not when you're alive. Not when, I'm marrying you for you. All right? That's... I don't think Mark's going to ask the question, what was this said? Did he write this after they were married? Or this is in the after they were fully married or between Erson and the Suin? Which one is true? Well, because the ask it. Because normally, whenever you, you use a term, if you want to say, I want to gift something to you, right? That's the difference. If I want to write a document, I'm gifting you the land that I own. And I give you the document. Okay, so that, that's the right language to use. But to say, I don't want anything to do, let's say we're partners in a piece of property. You say, you know, I don't want anything to do with the property. What does it mean? It means nothing. It means nothing. If you're the owner, you want to say you're transferring it to your partner, you're disowning it. Okay. But to say, I want nothing to do with the property, it doesn't make sense. Factually, the property is yours, so you have to use the right terminology. So that's going to be the Gemara's question on the Mishnah. I mean, the Mishnah, he says, I want nothing to do with the property, not with the produce. Now, so what? It's irrelevant what he said. It's nonsense. That's the Tani Tani Rebchia Ha'omer Lishto. Yeah. He read in the Mishnah, not that he wrote it in a document, but he said, that was his, his text of the Mishnah. So Mar asked the question, and if he wrote it, what, what's its value? This is the case we just spoke about. Two people are partners in the property. Right? And Ruven says to Shimon, the partners, I have nothing to do with this field. I have no, nothing to do with it. I'm removing my hand from it. These are the, these are the terminology he uses. Lo means nothing. Why? Because it's not a right terminology. When you want to gift something, when you want it sown. Amri hochi, amri devei Rabbi Yanai, bekosla ba'uda rusa. Our Mishnah speaking. No, once he's married her, he already has the rights. Then this would mean this would not be effective language. It's not the right. What about if you want to preempt it? When does the husband have these rights? He received these rights when he's fully married. So he says before he marries her, he says I, I have no interest in it. So there, it never came into his domain. Once in, in your domain, then you have to use terminology, which means you, that you're actually transferring it out. But once it's in your domain, say, I want nothing to do with it, it doesn't mean anything. So here it's speaking about she's not Russo. It's before it entered into his domain. So he says, I don't want it to enter into my domain. A, a, a uh, a property which comes from outside and, and the person wants to preempt it that it shouldn't come to him. The person has the right to what? To say, I don't want it. We'll see. Now, if you're of the opinion that a husband inherits a wife is purely rabbinical. It's rabbin, not a daraisa. It's machlux tanoim, if it's rabbinical daraisa. Now, why did the Chachamim say that the husband should inherit a wife? Of course, it's in his best interest. So the reason why they legislated because they want to benefit the husband. Husband says, I don't want the benefit. If we're only trying to do it because it's your best benefit, benefit your interest. You say, I don't, want, I don't want my, I'm not interested. So you have a right to turn it down. When the Torah says a person is an heir, let's say a, a son to a father. I'm not interested in the inheritance. Well, you're inheriting because you're a son. It's not because in your it's in your best interest. But why did the, if, if the husband inheriting a wife is purely rabbinical, 
and the reason why the motive behind, behind it is to benefit the husband. husband I'm not interested. Before, before he inherits, before she dies. So he could say it. That's Rafuna. That a person could make a precondition. I'm not interested. A person says, I'm not interested in the rabbinic enactment where they did it in my best interest. Go and zoo, show them low. Mike go and zoo, similar to something else. What a, a husband supports a wife. A husband supports a wife and he gets her earnings. Right? We had this in the before, right? Because otherwise it's not going to work out. I should support you. You should take your earnings, put it in your pocket. Because we're concerned that maybe the woman, if she works, she's not, either she's not fit to work, and even if she works, it may not cover her needs. So the Chachamim say, a husband has an obligation to support his wife. To guarantee that she's, that she's fed. Okay? What happens if the wife says, you know something? I earn enough money. I'm not interested. I'm not interested in your support. I'll keep my earnings. You keep your, you keep your support. A wife could say that to her husband. Because since initially, what was the basis for the enactment? To benefit the wife, because they're concerned she's going to be left penniless or she's not going to be left supported. So if the wife says, I'm not interested in the favor. So she could preempt that, say, I'm not interested. I don't want to be supported. I'm not going to give you my earnings. A woman could say that to her husband. So I'm going to ask a question. So if that's the case, well, if that's the case, just as by support, even after they're married, she could say, I'm not interested in being supported any longer. Let's see, she got, a, she got a bonus. The bonus is worth more than the husband could ever give her. So she just tells me, you know, something, I'm not interested. I'm not interested in your support because she doesn't want to give it up. She could say it. So why not even the sewer? So even if she's fully married, Omar Abayi in the sewer, Yodo ki Yodo. Because once they're married, they, she has, he has an equal claim in her, pro, in her properties. Not by, by what's his name? By support, but I'm saying, in terms of the property she has in the marriage, she brings in, they're like partners. So by partners, we said before, you have to use a different terminology, right? Rava ma yodo adifim yodo. He has even the upper hand. Nafkimino al shemir siyavim. So Rashi has a lengthy discussion over here. Iboilu. Now, we said in the Mishnah, if he rides, let's say they're married, they're married, and he says, I want nothing to do with the properties. We say it's meaningless. He had to say this when she was in Arusa, before the properties came to him. He says, I'm not, Chacham want to do good for me. I'm not interested. I'm not interested. I'm not interested in your favor. He has a right to say that. Once they transfer it, you're there already. You want to relinquish it? You have to use the right terminal. I'm gifting it to you. I'm disowning it. Anything other than that. What about if he makes a Kenyan? He, they're fully married. He says to his wife, I want nothing to do with it. And he makes a Kenyan. He writes in the document a Kenyan. He does, let's say, Kenyan Suder. I want nothing to do with it, and he says, you give me your, 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 your garment, I'll give it back to you. Right? He says, you know something? The dinud varim is what? You, we said dinud varim means nothing. So what's konam yodo? I'm showing you, I mean what I'm saying when I say I have nothing to do with your properties. But when you say those words, it means nothing. It's meaningless words. When you say those words regarding that, it has, it has value. Because since you're using the Kenyan, the Kenyan compensates for the language. Yeah. When do we say it works? When do we say it doesn't work? But let's say he says that, to, uh, two people are partners, they're partners, he says, one partner says to him, I want nothing to do with the property, and they do a kinyut suda. All of a sudden, when this fellow partner wants to take possession, he starts screaming, what are you, what are you, where are you going? That's clear, he, he doesn't want to transfer it. But, let's say time passes, right? He, he made a kinyon, and then, let's say they make the kinyon, so it's, it's already understood. He man has, has, has possession. Now, two days later, the one who originally transfers says, by the way, uh, you know something, it's not, it's not what I meant. It doesn't make a difference. Because then we say he meant what he meant. Omra Meimo, you hear what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We say, but he, but it, no. Of course, the Kenyan, no. But the wife, he didn't make a Kenyan. It would be the same thing with the wife. He didn't make a Kenyan. If he uses language which is, which is not adequate language, and he makes a Kenyan. So if Yosef is, is differentiating whether 
the person protested immediately that he, two partners two part didn't mean what he said or he let time pass and then he protested if initially he started he made a tumult immediately th then you know the whole thing means nothing didn't mean it right that's what he says then it's not, but Ome, but he lets it pass, and that, right? And then afterwards he comes, that means, somebody says, by the way, if you want it back, that's what you do. But additionally, he meant what he said. When he did the Kenyon, he meant to transfer it. Rabbeim says, we rule that, no, that even immediately, if he, it was a Kenyan, like Rav Nachman said, the transfer is the transfer. Omele Ravash Lameima, but Orer Oba Omed. He says, when you're saying that we rule that you, it's a valid transfer for the Kenyan's made. Is it speaking about even when the person protested immediately or t time had to pass? What he says, my nafka minuch Rav Yosef Omele Lo Shemiali, Kloma Lo Sviroli. He says, I, I don't agree with Rav Yosef. If you make a Kenyan, even though the language is not sufficient, the Kenyan compensates. For the lack of language. Okay? We'll see at the end we rule like Rav Yosef. The Gemara on the next page. We rule like Rav Yosef that it's, if it's immediate, he, he protests, it's nothing. If time passes, then it's a valid transfer. Samara so says, if in fact we say it means nothing, in K. Lomakos of law, right? The Tamo lay. Now, what does it say in the mission? It says that if a woman man writes, Din the Chosim, I have nothing to do with your properties. So what does the mission say? And he was saying, when did he write this? He wrote it when she was in Arusa, right before it came to him. So what does the mission say? That if she sells it off, it's a valid sale, right? Which is after the marriage, if he sells, she sells off, probably it's valid. So Mario has a question, but, but Peros he has. If she dies, he inherits most more. How do we know that's what he meant? Maybe he meant he doesn't want the Peros. How do we know it means that the sale is, that she sells it as a sale? Maybe what he meant was this and not that. In the sale? was saying when, when, he, when, he, when he preempted, he says, I want nothing to do with your properties. He meant not full. He meant if you sell it, it should be valid. I will not interfere with that right. So Mar says, Why can't she say to him, maybe when you wrote, I have nothing to do with your properties, maybe he relinquished everything. What are we only limiting it if she sells it? It's a valid sale. Maybe he gave up payros and he gave up inheritance. Since it's not clear, it's not clear what he gave up. So who's the mosik? Who's who's in possession? He does. When we started off, he has all rights. Now the question is, how much did he give up? So therefore, we inter say he gave up the least amount. What's the least? The least is selling it off. That he that he, that the sales sales. More asks. I have a payri. So even we say it's the least amount, maybe he's giving up payros, but if he sells it off, it's not a valid sale. We have one of three things. We have sale, the profits, and inheritance. We say, what did he give up if she sells it? So Mar asks, payri. maybe he's giving up the fruits, the profits. Amr Abaye, you know, there's the, the, the expression, a bird in the hands worth two in the bush. Here, Howard. That's what this means. But sino tav mikro. A small gourd is better than a large gourd. You understand? A small catch is, is better than a large catch if it's a question of the large catch is ever going to take place. Meaning, fruits are going to happen. That happens naturally. Is she going to sell it off? What's the likelihood of selling off the property? She may not even sell it. Factually, the field is producing. The field has profits. If there's a piece of property, real estate, it, there's rent. That's ongoing. So what would I prefer to give up? This... So the property is worth more, but if she doesn't sell off the property, I don't have anything worse. I prefer to take what's sure, which is the fruits, the profits, than what. So therefore, that's what I'm giving up. So Mar says, Amy, me, Rusha. Maybe he's giving up the inheritance. We have three things, right? Death is more common than selling off. A person doesn't sell off property so quickly. These are her properties she bought from her family. So therefore, her, the likelihood of dying is more likely of selling off. So if he's giving up, what's he going to give off? What's least likely? Least. What he prefers to give up something which is less common. But something which is more common, that he doesn't remove himself from. Okay? Ravashi Omar. That's, that's Abayi's answer. That's what we say. What did he relinquish? Only the right that if he, she, she should sell it, the sale is a valid sale. 
Rav Hashem ben Chosayich v'lo Pirusayin v'lo ben Chosayich v'lo Achamisa. He says it, it actually lies in the world. What does no Chosayich mean? No Chosayich means when is it called her properties? I'm giving up from your properties. If you sell it off, we say that means selling it off. That means it's not your properties. Okay, that's already explained. Where is it? She, 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 she. He said, I'm giving up the property is not the fruits. What do we say? He's still there. We ask the question: Why does he get the fruits? Because he says the chosayich means that the property. So I can give up the fruits. What about being there? He says I'm giving up your property. So when she dies, is it her property? It's not called her property any longer. The he he's the heir. So that that even give up? Because when death it transfers immediately. Okay, further. Rabbi Yudomer. Rabbi Yudah says that even if he writes the Chosayach Perosayach, but the Peri Peros, the fruits of the fruits, that belongs to him. Torah about Elohim Peros. What are the fruits? Elohim Peri Peros. Listen to the story. You're with me? Norman. Hechnis lo karka. She brings property into the field. Ve'osis a Peros. And there was produce on the field. What is that? Ha'ehi Peros. That's Peros. So he gave up the rights to the property and payros. Mocha payros. What about they sell the fruits and now they buy a piece of property with the Velokakamikarka Vos and now that new property produces fruit. Harehim Peru Peros, that's Peru Peros. That's the profits of the prophet. He has the right to that, it's Rebuda. Iboilu. So Rebuda says, How does he relinquish everything? He has to write, I have nothing to do with the property, with the fruits, the fruits of the fruits, ad olam forever. So now the Gemara is what exactly is the main language? What, really, what extricates him from everything? Iboy, Lord of Yudah, Peri, Peris, Dapko. When he said Peri, Peris, does it stop there? He says, Peros, the fruits, and the prophets of the prophets. But beyond that, he does get. O Duma, Arolam, Dapko. We want to, this Peri, Peris, Dapko, or Arolam, Dapko. The word Arolam means forever. Forever. O, Dilma Tavaridav means both. Peri Peros means exactly that. And Arol means that. So we're saying, Imtim Slobod Peri Peros Davko. If we say Peri Peros means, Rega. Okay, we're saying. Ipsilom of Peri Peris Dafko Ad Olam Lomali. If Peri Peris means forever, what does he have to write? Ad Olam. Right, what does Ad Olam mean? Ad Olam means forever. But if Peri Peris means, it's, it's only a way of expression, the prophets of the prophets, whether how long they go, so what do you have to write? Ad Olam. How come Ashlam came because Peri Peris came out the cause of Allah? Ad Olam. Domi. You know what it means? It means that Peri Peris is the equivalent of writing Ad Olam. Vim Tibs Ad Olam Dafko. If Ad Olam means forever, Peri Peris Lomali. What does he have to write, Peri Peris? If he says, I have nothing with, with your field and its produce forever, what do you have to write? The fruits of the fruits, the prophets of the prophets. Kamash la avagab, the cost la Peri Peros. Even though he wrote Peri Peris, which means it stops at that point, because of Olam, eh? If he wrote Ad Olam, that's when it's forever. Ilo Kosov, lo. But if he doesn't write that, to what degree is he relinquishing? Only the prophets of the prophets, but the prophets of the prophets of the prophets that he's not giving up. And if you say each one in its own right means forever, Tartilomli, so he's, he's like saying the same words. Peri Peris means forever. Arolam means forever. So what do you need? Peri Peris and Arolam, right? It's saying the same thing. It's like somebody saying, um, it's, it's outstanding, it's magnificent. Right? If they both words mean the same thing, you, you just, you're saying the same thing over. So Peri Peris means, I don't want it forever, it means forever. As many times they prophets. And our Olim, so what he's saying, both, both, both terminologies. Because of, it's a Mercedes Trichel. 
Because of peri peri is low cost of at all. Um, if I only wrote peri peri, I'm right at all. I'm have a mean of peri peri, sued low ochil. I would think peri peros, you will not eat avo peri. The peri peri is ochil. But the prophets of the prophets, you would eat. Lochi to had all. Because of at all, I'm low cost peri peri, so have a mean of all. I'm a peris code. Hear this. It means this. I don't want anything to do with your, pro your, your property. The peros, ad let's see, peros ad olam. So what does peros ad olam mean? The original peros, I will never benefit from them. But let's say the profits of those peros, maybe I can. So peri peros says, goes beyond the first peros. And ad olam means forever. Iboilu. Kosev lo dinu dvarm enli b'nuchaisu peri peros. He didn't write out olam. He wrote, I will have nothing to do with your property and the peri peri and the fruits of the fruits. Ma'u she yochob peros mi peri peros. Could he eat the prophets of the prophets? Right? The prophets of the prophets of the prophets. Isok nafshi mi peri. Maybe. So nafshi peri lo sok nafshik. Yeah. Mi peri Excuse me. Maushi yochel peiros mi peir peiros. Solok nafshei mi peiri mi peiri peiros solok nafshei. The alien milchasaychol peiri peiros. Maushi yochel peiros mi peiri peiros. No, mi peiros. Yet he says, he says, I, I'm not going to have to do with your land and peiri peiros. You hear this? The prophets. So what about the first prophets? The prophets, the prophets not, but the prophets, yes. Maybe the first prophets, let's say he says, yeah. right? Samara so says, the Gemara doesn't ask on this, it means it doesn't make any sense. Odil mekol mili solok nafshik. So much chito. Odil mekol chito, the mekol mili solok nafshik. Why? The amrit peri peri solok nafshik, peri lo solok nafshik, came in the achlinu le peri, peri peri smehecho. You have this. A person says, I will not benefit from the land and from the, the fruits of the fruits. So we have a question. What about the first prophets? If the first prophets he consumes, right? So it comes out there's no prophets of those, then it's his, right? So how could we talk about the next step if he, he owns the first step, the first stage? means left over, mean like this. He says, I, I, will, I have no claim to the prophets of the prophets. So, but the question is like this, when he writes that, is he giving up even the base prophet? Or he's only giving up the props that prop, what's the, he has a right to, to clear the field and consume it. What happens if you leave some of that's left over and it's invested? The profit of that investment is hers. You understand? You're following? No, that he says, I'm giving up peri peros. So right. says, but if the, he, he consumes the peros, there's no peri peros. It's right. being, but he didn't consume the peri. He didn't consume all the peros. Let's say he took the peros, put it into, into real estate. So that's his, but the pro, that's the profits of the, his profit. That, that, that's what he, he has no, to rent. She'll collect the rent. She'll collect the rent. Because he, that's what he only gave up the profit of the profit. So the, the, the house may be his, because he took the property with the real estate. But the rent on that real estate, he says, I'm giving up. That belongs to her. Reb Shimgalil Omer. Reb Shimgalil says he could relinquish everything except inheritance. Why? Because the husband is, inherits the wife. You can't be master mashkos about Torah. Omer Rav Halochah, Rav says, Halochah Reb Shimgalil. Lomitamek. We rule like Reb Shimgalil, but not for his reason. My What does that mean? We rule like him that you can't make, you can't relinquish Yerusha, right? But it's not for his. Does he mean to say that if she dies, he inherits her regardless? Tonight, Rav Shimgalil says by Yerusha, that's what's the reason why he can't do it? Tonight, Rav Sovet no Kayam. Because since we're dealing with monetary thing, with monetary, you can make such a tonight. Because he always like Rabbi Yehuda. Remember, we had a, a Gemara in the, in the fifth parak. A man marries a woman. I'm marrying on the condition that I don't have to feed you or clothe you. So it was a machlokas. It's master mashkos Torah. Because Torah says you have to feed a wife 
You have to clothe her. So, so Rabbi Yudah says, since she could wave that, you could make it tonight. That's not Masa Mashkos Batora. That's not making a condition which is contrary to what the w- will of the Torah is. Anything she could wave, that's not. So over here, no, no, which means, let's say a man wants to give his wife clothing, and she says, I'm not interested. You don't have to, you, she doesn't want you to have to give it to her. There is an obligation, but she could wave it. Right? Ksova Yerusha, why? Rav Sov to no So why over here? Ksova, Rav holds Yerusha, Sabal Jabonan. That that her husband inherits a wife, that's purely rabbinical. Here, it's not a Doraisa. So why over here can't he relinquish that? Why? Even though it's rabbinical, and on Torah level you could relinquish it, but since it's rabbinical, they want to give it strength, even to a greater degree, even than a Torah law. So more asks, the Southern Rav to Kayom? You mean, say, Rav holds that by a monetary situation, Rav holds that if you precondition it, the Tanai is in effect, let's say a man wants to overcharge a person. Here? Right, you're not permitted to overcharge a person, whatever the price is. Let's say a man buys, sells something, <coughs> buys something, says, I'm buying it on the condition that the laws of Ono are not subject to this sale. Here? You're not permitted to overcharge a person. So it's, it's a monetary claim. And a man s- buys something, sells something, says, I'm selling to you on the condition that you have no financial claim for me, even if I overcharge you. That's what he says to the buyer. The seller says to the buyer, you want to buy this? I don't want to co- come back and tell me I overcharge you. Right? That you have no claim of, ono, of overcharging. Rav Rav says he has the financial claim because Torah says you're not permitted. That precondition to the sale is not a valid condition. So what are we dealing with? We're dealing with money. Let's say I overcharge you. Right? I overcharge you double the price. And then afterwards when you find out, you say, you know, I'm willing to waive the claim. You have a right to waive it. But yet Rav says, even though it's a waivable claim, but if you make such a condition, it's not a valid condition. So you see Rav holds that by a monetary situation, even though the claim is waivable, the Tanai is not valid. So here also by Yerusha, even though it's monetary, she has a right, he has a right when he gets to do what he wants with it. But to waive it, he can't waive it. Shmuel Omar, ain't no law of Uno. Shmuel says, no, it is a valid tonight. That he has no claim of Uno. This buyer has no claim of Uno that he overturned to the seller because that was the original condition. So what exactly did Rav say? Rav was saying, Rav says, halocha, we rule like Rishim and Gamliel that he, he inherits, even though he made it tonight, but not for his reason. But we're proving now that Rav holds that if it's monetary, you can't make it tonight. So he holds exactly like Shim Gamliel. So what does he mean? We rule Shim Gamliel, but not for his reason. What does it mean for not for his reason? It is for his reason. El Achru Shim Gamliel, we rule like Shim Gamliel, we rule like Shim to no Boto. rule like him. By monetary, you cannot make it tonight, as we see from Ono. What does it mean, but not for his reason? Rav Shimgalu is of the opinion that a husband on a Torah level is the heir of the wife. That's from Shimgalu. Rav Sova, lo Yerusheno. Right? He holds no, she's not, he's not the heir of the wife. Yerusha Sabal is only rabbinical. So, Mars Haimi Taime, love Gilso. I by saying that. He holds, she doesn't, say that it's not me, ta- it's, it's hi me tame, it's not, he's ruling that we don't rule like that. If he's saying that he doesn't inherit, if that's the case, he's not ruling like Shem Gamliel. He, his statement was, we rule like Shem Gamliel, but not for his reason. So we're saying, a husband doesn't inherit a wife. A husband doesn't, so that means he's not ruling like Shem Gamliel. El Elcha Shem Gamliel, the Omer Imei Yerusheno. He rules that if, the, if she dies, he inherits her. On a rabbinic level, Rav Shimgali was of opinion on Doraiso, the Tanai is Botil. Tanai is not. But rabbinically, you could relinquish it. Yeah, Tanai Kayim, meaning if it would be Drabonon. Rav Sova, I feel the Drabonon to no Botil. Hear this? I mean, Rishim Galil says the only reason why it's Masa Mashkos about Torah is because it's the, the husband being an heir is a, a Doraisa. But if it would be only rabbinical, the Tanai would be in effect. Rav says no. Even to be rabbinical, the Tanai is not in effect. The Tanai is not in effect. 
Rabbi Shimon says clearly, why is it, why is it not valid? Because that that a husband inherits a wife is a Torah law. So what's the rabbinic law? The condition would be a valid condition. Rabbi says no, that even if we rabbinical, the Tanai is still not valid. So he's agreeing in halacha, but he's disagreeing in the rationale. It's not because it's though, right? It's even rabbinical. The Tanai is not a Tanai. So that Mar says, Hai ketami chilso. So it's, he's, it's for the same reason. It's masla, it's, it's the Tanai is not valid. And we're ruling. Rab Mosefu. Rab is adding. Right? It's not lav mitami. He's adding. He says, I agree with you. Right? I agree that it, it's only what? It, on the Raisa, you say it's, it's not the Tanai's bottle. It's rabbinical, would be. I'm saying even rabbinical. So in what way is he saying different? He's saying that Yerusha is Doraisa. Hello, Hachal Kripshim Gamliel, Dami Mesa Yerusheno. Lab Tab Yerushim Gamliel, Sava Yerusha Baal Doraisa. Ripshim Gamliel is of the opinion that a husband inherits a wife, that's a Torah law. Bukhala Masmash calls him a Torah to no Baal. Rab so Yerusha Sabal Drabon on Rishim Gamliel. Rab holds it's only rabbinical that a husband inherits a wife. The Chachomos of his Lubreim Kishel Torah. That's what it means. We rule of Shimon Gamliel that the husband inherits regardless. And Master Moshe Batora is what is not a Tanai. But here, rabbinically, what's the reason why the Tanai is Botel? Because they empowered the Drabona even more than the Raisa. This particular case. In this particular case. So we're asked now. So we're establishing now what does Rav hold? Yerusha Sabal's Drabona. Not that a husband inherits a wife is purely rabbinical. Mercy says, is it possible? Rav Sov Yushas Val Drabonon. But Tanan, Rabbi Yochanan and Broko Ome, Hayoresh Es Ishto. Here, a man who inherits his wife. Yazur Libne Mishvocha. What happens if a husband inherits a wife? Let's say we're talking about a what? No. You, you tell me. You said you know it already. No, no, no. Person inherits a cemetery, a cemetery. Talk about a cemetery here, right? So it's it's a disrespect if all the family, her family is buried in a cemetery. Also, you start burying other people there. You know, this is a family burial center o location. Only families buried there. So Yorish is ishto. Person inherits his wife. Yaslim mishpocha. He has to give the burial location, the cemetery, back to the family. And he takes a small amount of money. For, because really he has a right. He, he inherits his wife. He has to give, out of respect for the, her family, he has to give her back the burial location. And then afterwards, but they, pay, they compensate him a small amount of money. Not the true value of the cemetery. This is Rabbi Yochum Mevroka. What, what is Rabbi Yochum? If you say a husband, legally, on a Torah level, is the heir of that wife, Right? Why should he give him back anything? He's there. Idrabonon, if rabbinically he inherits, domimai avidetayu. And it's only rabbinical, and they, the rabbonon say, but this is the exception to rule, give it back. So why do they have to give him anything? Amrav Volg of Yerushas Baal Doraiso. Here. Factually, Yerushas Baal is Doraiso. It's Doraiso. The husband inherits the wife on a Torah level. Called Shirishoso Ishto Besakvoros that what he inherited from his wife is a cemetery. Mishum Pekam But it's Pekam How does it look? It's a disgrace to the family now that it, it, the husband, he's going to bury his family there. His brother is his family. It's, it's a disgrace. So even though the Torah says he has a right to it, rabbinically they intervene and they say, you know something, it's, it's the wrong thing. We want you to sell it back to her family and you'll take a small amount of money for it. Omer Abona, Lishkul Demei Vleheder. Take a, a money and give it back. Give the, base, the, the cemetery that you inherited from your wife, give it back to her family. No, we're, we're explaining. It says that when a husband inherits a wife, he should give the inheritance back to the wife. The it doesn't make any sense. If he's, he has a right, why is he giving it back? So the Gemara's answer is being an inherited cemetery. So because it would be a... Um, it would be a, an offense to the family. That's what he gives it back, and he has a right to take back the what he says. The may kever ishto. 
No, 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 no. Umayi nakalahen min adomim. He deducts from the price the value of the grave because his wife's buried there. He benefited from it, right? Because he buried his wife in that, in that, in that cemetery. Because his wife is part of the family. They're not opposed to the wife. Yeah, but it's, it's more. Maybe they'll, they'll let him in. No, maybe, but until now it's like his that he can do anything he wants with it. He could just sell, sell, he could sell it. One second. Yeah. Kiritanyo Hamocher Kibro. Beder Kibro. Mamoru Mokem Espedo. Let's see a person sells his own grave. person is part of a family uh, plot, and he sells his grave. He sells the access to the grave, and he sells the location where normally they would eulogize him. Born by Mishwach of the Korv and also Balkorcho. Doesn't make a difference. Even sold to a third party, the family could say, that's yours, you never had a right to sell it. Because to sell it, it's a disgrace for us. Somebody else should be buried. Bishop Pegam Mishpocha. So what do we see over here? We see from Rabbi Yochum and Baroka that what? That Yerusha is the Oraiso. Right, this is Rav explaining it. Rav explained Rabbi Yochum and Baroka holds Yerusha is the Oraiso, but because of Begam it's, it's a it's a blight on the family, therefore we force him to relinquish the sale. But so you see, Rav holds like Rabbi Yochum and Baroka. Well, clearly we say Rabbi Yochum and Baroka, Rav is saying holds Yerusha is the Oraiso. We're saying now Rav holds Yerusha is Rabbonon, but the reason why he can't relinquish is it because they empowered the Drabonon more than a Doraisa. On that, the Mara says, Rab the Tem Yochum and Broker Kama. Rab is only explained with Yochum and Broker, but he personally holds. Vale lo Svirle. Rab is only coming to explain with Yochum and Broker. If Yochum and Broker holds, Yerusha's Doraisa. Similar to Rishim Gamliel, Yerusha's Doraisa. What does he personally hold, Rab? It's rabbinical. And that's what Mishnah says, even if he tries to relinquish it, he can't. But why? Because the Chachomim empower Drabonon, give greater strength to a Drabonon than a Dorai. So, okay, it's good. Next Mishnah. Misha Meis, a man dies. Now listen what happens. Now, Aksuba, from what do you collect Aksuba? You collect Aksuba, a wife does not inherit a husband. But she has a right to Aksuba, she has a right to many things. She cannot collect, she collects from fixed property, not from the Tauplin. Not from movables. The movables belong to the to the heir, to the Yosomin, right? To the children of the of the deceased. Misha mes v'niach isha u'balcho v'yorshin. Hear this? He left of a wife, creditors, and heirs. Now, the question: Who has priority to collect? Hear this story. V'ayilo pikodin, and he had he gave something to a third party for safekeeping. It's not in the possession of the heirs. He gave it to a custodian. O milva biyarachero, or somebody owed him money. He said, we're talking about something which is immovable, but it's not in his possession. When he dies, it's not in, as part of the estate. It's out there. Reb Tafanom, you know, the kosher shaben. Reb Nosson says, you give it to the one who has the weakest claim. Second. No, you give it to the weak. Who's the weakest of the three of them? The wife, the ksuba. Ksuba doesn't collect from 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 the Taplin and the, and the and the creditor. So kosher means to the weaker of them. No, no, the weaker is the what's his name. The creditor and the woman are the weakest. You, you, no, no, you cannot collect the ksuba from movables. They have a million dollars in cash, they tell her to go fly a kite. Right, right. So who's the weakest if you have a picotin somewhere? Who should get it? Normally, if they would have that asset, 
the movie will, the, you saw him say goodbye, we don't, you have no right to it. So who's the weaker one? She's the weaker one. The one, no, 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 the weakest one, the ones who, who have, who's in the most precarious position to collect. A Balchov does not collect for movables, and the woman doesn't collect for movables. The credit doesn't collect, and she doesn't collect. So who has a claim now to the object that's by the custodian, by the showman? She, or the what, or the creditor. Because once it's returned to the Yorshim, they can't collect any longer. To the, which was the third party? No, we're going to explain it. We'll explain it. We'll explain it. We'll exp Who has a claim? That's what we're saying now because it's not, but again, we're saying even though it's immovable, they have a claim on it because it's not in the hands of the Yorkshire, even though it's immovable. Yeah, even though it's immovable. Reb Kibo me'ain marachim nebedin. No. Yeah. There's no rachmanus. Factually, the creditor and the woman does not collect for movables. There's no such as rachmanus. Elo yinosli yorshim. Reb Kibo says you give it to the heirs, to the children. So it's clear. Howard. You see? It's clear. Reb Tarfin saying it goes to the weaker one, which is the wife or the creditor. Reb Kibo says no, there's no rachmanus here. They don't collect for movables. Who, who does it go to? It goes to the heirs, to the children. Okay. One second. What's the reason? Now, who has the claim to it? Without an oath, could the Balchov collect? He has to take an oath. Maybe he was paid off already. The Balchov is the creditor. And the wife, maybe he also paid her off. So in terms of who has greater relevance to that asset, even though it's by the custodian, or by the, right? Who has, who has greater claim to it? The Yorshim. They'd have to swear it's theirs. You want to take it from them. Who ha right? They're closer to it than she or the creditor is. No, first of all, movables, they have no claim. Initially, but, but, but no, no, no. Inheritors have everything. So if it's fixed property, there's a lien. But we say movables are not liened. But w which movables are not liened, even though, even though the Yorshim have it? That's movables which they're in possession of. But movables that are by the custodian, because they're in the, the, the wife and the creditor are in a weak position, we allow them to take it. Reb Kiva says, I disagree. Factually, it goes to the Yorshim. Why? Because in terms of who's, even when it's by the custodian, who has greater access? The heirs or she or, or the creditor? The Yorshim, the heirs. If, if they say, give us our father's item back, they have a right to say that. Factually, it's the father's item. It's theirs. Even though it's by the Shomer, whose is it? It's theirs. Here, you want to collect. What do you have to do before you collect? You have to take an oath. So therefore, it's in, in essence, you're taking it away from them. You have no right to take it away from the Yisomim, from the, because it's immovable. What about he left over fruits that were harvested, grain that was harvested from the property? If you want to seize it, hear this? Even though it's immovable, let's say she took more produce than she was supposed to take, more than the value of Ksuba. So what's left? Give to the weaker one. Give to the weaker one. Give to the weaker one. Why is the produce li different than the cash? We said, if you have movables, Reb Kiva says, the movables belong to, belong to the, the heirs. All of a sudden, we're talking about the produce was left on the, fa on the field, and then afterwards, they went and seized it, and they seized too much. How do they have a even right to seize it? <coughs> right? How do they have a right to seize it? The produce belongs to the what? To, to the ocean. Right? Same thing. 